And now, another really great, a really organized, well-thought-out score, this time from Doug. And, yeah, I mean, I, I really love all of this. I think it's it, it all works really great on the first page. It's sort of like a, the intro is almost like a, uh, a wind serenade, <laughs> right, in the style of the Grand Partita, right? It just has the same kind of vibe and very similar instrumentation, almost no flutes at first, and, and the flutes are kind of doubling oboe parts. So yeah, until until right about here, well actually flutes doubling clarinets as well. So they don't really stand out as a separate element except for really the piccolo here. So one might be fooled into listening to it and thinking, oh yeah, it's just sort of like um, you know, wind octet or wind serenade kind of scoring. Plus percussion of course, down here. Uh, you know, I mean, just maybe a different way of thinking out these trade-offs. Like, maybe better to have one player take the first two baton strokes and then the other player to take the, the last one. Like, say, maybe the second on the first two strokes and then the third, sorry, the first on the on the last one, right? And that way the last player can just play this ba ba bump right? A little bit. And then ought to, of course, is fine. Uh... But yeah, uh, and kind of the same thing here, rather than kind of trading off back and forth and back and forth, uh, it's probably easier to take breaths like that are more coordinated with the beat rather than just trading off different beats. All right. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, it's so cool though. You know, oboe starting instead of flute and oboes working really, really well with bassoons getting a very homogeneous kind of double reed tone and then a little bit of punches from our horns uh and this is all really fun right in here just this 
this kind of gallivanting style. The horns kind of keeping up the sense of like a very jumpy little jig or jig, right? Um, and then, you know, nice combinations. Uh, I'm not sure what whether this is first flute or atu or whatever. See, here you say one, so I'm just wondering, is this the second flute or is this atu? Not really sure. So this is actually going to end up being a fairly highly scored um, or fa fairly high-pitched excerpt here or section here for the English horn because this is going to be written D sharp, right? And this is going to be written A sharp. So, and then A sharp slurring back down to C sharp. I mean, it's all totally doable, don't get me wrong. It just really fattens us up. You know, we've got, we're, we end up having three oboe family members on the same pitch plus flute, right? Uh, so, it's pretty intense. And, and you've got, I don't know how many clarinets are here, maybe one, maybe a two. So, so there are so many dedicated to this, uh, to this melody right here, plus a couple of horns on the bottom. I almost wonder whether or not there could have been more patterning. I mean, you already have plenty of patterning here. Uh, bass clarinet in B flat. Now this is, so if this is in C, if this concert score, is this supposed to sound an octave lower? Because I don't see an ottava, right? Because this would be very, very high indeed if that were a bass clarinet part. So I'm going to assume that this is an octave lower. Uh, just, you know, basically playing an octave higher than the bassoons, or this bassoon, I should say. Yeah, and then just those little jolts here from timpani, those work great. Here I would say, like, if nothing else is staccato, really, I mean, maybe these finishing pitches could be, like, just just full uh, regular eighth notes, right? Because that'll help out with the accent, right? Whereas if you go, so you've got two different articulation styles here. So if, if this is, I mean, it doesn't need to be accented like this. This is where the accent should go, and that's all good. But... If you have like a staccato in one part on either side, uh, you know, actually, and and you've got the accent in the middle, it just really kind of distracts away from the accent, right? So it would be better just to have these to be eighth notes, right? Because they don't really need to be short; they could just be part of everything else that's going on. And the same thing is true here. You don't need an accented eighth, sorry, sixteenth note. This could be an accented eighth note and just work along with everything else in that passage. All right, well, this goes into the whole scrubbing vibe, right? And just, you know, pretty simple here. We've got uh, clarinets and octaves, if, if I am right. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, so really seriously, if you're going to do concert score, bass clarinet, and do this sort of octave, um, you know, written an octave higher than intended, then put like a you know, maybe an octave, um, like that little, or, or, or maybe mark here, you know, concert score equals ottava or something like that. Just, just kind of let us know, right? Okay, so anyways, but back to this, we've got our octave of clarinets working together, and, um, yeah, if your bass clarinet can last for this long, that smoothly, then maybe so can one of these clarinets, right? And and just really just play along with the bass really, really clearly and and um, and just like in the pocket. And that could be true of your flutes as well. Like this could all be first flute and that could be second flute and so on, right? You could trade off to allow for breathing or maybe just like not even have the flutes come in until right here because like nobody's really gonna hear them against all these other wind instruments so powerful, right? Um, especially not with like horn in the bass. Like the horn is going to, like its overtones are going to uh, kind of erase the the flute, right? Because it's they're so similar that like the the kind of that cloud of 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 overtone coming from the from the horns. It sort of has almost like a cloudy or or kind of fuzzy sound. Uh, that very that may very well just lock right onto what the flute is doing, 
and and blot it out. So, uh, but but uh, I mean these these little flurries wouldn't get uh, wouldn't get pushed out by the horn, but they would get probably overwhelmed by the oboe and clarinet working together. All right. So, but anyways, all that aside. So enter with the flute right here, and then you know maybe you could do like first and then second here and then atu or or just have like a single flute going all the way through and then trade off between the two you're really trying here not to use up anybody's breath and that's totally admirable but also you need to think about the um the continuity of the part too and like whether or not it makes any sense to the player and like whether or not they're able to really come in with any kind of you know meaning right if, if it's just they have just a little bit of something all the time right um, these are great so like here you are really going down to a sharp and this is going to be very honky and you know like for your standard semi-pro player um, you might just end up with a kind of a blat down here so like this is where it would be better for the for the oboist to be higher right and the clarinetist to be lower hmm? because it's just much more control right in there the English horn is great, but yeah, the oboes, this is just really low. It's possible, but it's, it really is just kind of fat and honky and quacky down there, right? Um, yeah, and then, yeah, horns, all good, trumpets. Yeah, so that all works pretty well, and then you've got this got this dying away there's there's there isn't really a big drop here except for kind of this this little um kind of snap here by the by the brass right and then this is lovely coming in here with our lower strings but i sort of feel here that this is more of a cello note and this is more of a viola thing they're very you know it's very strange to hear um the double bass and the second violins working together. Uh, intonation is not the most optimum, but it will still work fine. Um, it, yeah, but players that are very close to each other in pitch work better. Like the, you know, these pitches right here, these are the same as the uh, viola's lowest, natu uh, lowest C natural, right? So it's the same exact note as this. So mm -hmm. you could get more copacetic instruments and like maybe less... You know, or this could be this could be double bass and that could be viola, and you could have two instruments that kind of resemble each other more in kind of having that little ceiling on their tone, right? Uh, but otherwise, really cool first page. Just really enjoyed it, and and you know maybe just a few little adjustments would fix it right away. Now moving on from A, this is just such fun. Uh, I mean, there are some things in here. I'm I'm probably going to say, hey, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? But the overall concept here is just so much fun. Okay, so this is interesting right in here. Some people might be asking, well, look, why didn't you have two trumpets on top? And then, you know, and then instead of doubling the horns below. But actually, this is really good scoring because it reinforces the top note of the trumpet rather than doubling, like, like this is fine to double B flat, sorry B and C sharp, and then F sharp up here. Once you get like around F sharp, getting higher and so on and so forth, it becomes like really, you know, it like it's just a really really fine intonation that's required from concert trumpet players. It becomes sort of problematic the same way that really exposed um, oboes are, right? So um, like this right in here, this is gonna have a real edge to it. Right? These A2 notes up here on A, A sharp, and so on and so forth. They're totally possible, but it's just, you know, it, it it's probably the kind of thing where, you know, the, the telescoping of the line right here into each other is probably not as necessary, right? Um, but... But what's cool about this is, like, we've got the same old patterns, like oboes and, you know, violin, got some cello in there and everything else. And then everything kind of just gives over to this much stronger timpani um, uh, plus horns, you know, plus oboes and strings and everything else. It just, like, it starts to interrupt more and more, right, as things go by. And I just love that. Um, then there's... 
you know, the timpani, like, you're kind of asking a lot of different pitches from the timpanist. You probably could just get away with three Bs here, just, you know, chonk, 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 right? Or three F sharps. Same thing here, you get away with three G sharps or three D sharps. Because the the ear is really not going to pick them out as much as you think, right? So, I mean, but otherwise, like, look, look at how much retuning the timpanist has to do, right? He has to change from these three pitches to... He's got to change his B to an A sharp, and then uh, okay. So now he probably would have to just reconfigure all his three top timpani. So like the B has to change to G sharp, the C sharp has to change to A sharp, and everything else, right? Whereas you just get the same effect just if you just go the same exact note, boom, 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 right? And the 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 ear fills in the rest, right? Make make people's ears do all the work. And like right here, you got. Tuba, I'm not sure what you mean by A3 tuba. It probably is, this is probably a copy paste error from uh, these trumpets here, right? So, um, yeah, so like if the tuba is, if the tuba is playing this, these three pitches, then the timpani only needs to play like one pitch, right? Or it could play, it could go G sharp, G sharp, D sharp, and then the ear just changes the second G sharp into an A sharp, right? Okay, um, yeah, so pretty playable other than that. Yeah, all three trumpets here is just going to be, that's going to be fierce, man. Um, and then, yeah, the everything else sort of falling into place. Yep, so that's all very, very clear. Um, okay. This was kind of fun too. I like the division of you know the the sort of breaking up of the patterns here and the strings, and um, bass clarinet plus bassoon. That's all good. This little reaching up here, okay. And yeah, like I said before, this probably doesn't need to have a two right up there on those very highest notes, okay. And but you know the horns are really cool and everything else. Okay, so I think. You might have gotten dis gotten distracted in your scoring process, or you might have let the piano score fool you. All right, but this bar right here is setting up a new phrase right here. Right, so so like you took the setup bar and you turned that into the first phrase of the new orchestration. Right, so like this is guiding us to some new place right but when we get there you keep it in the same style of orchestration right so that's that is the only fly in the ointment for me on this page here right is that it you know it is building toward yeah and then of course with this already behind it um right it just it just is like it doesn't it it just feels like the um, the whole pacing is, is a little strange right in there. So, yeah, but I do think that it's cool the way that you divide up these, um, these arpeggiated lines. That's kind of the way to do it. Then the player only has to worry about a few notes per bar. So that, that would be, that would be good. This is all great right in here. Accent plus slur. That is going to work great. Now, of course, these strings are going to be very much in the background, uh, against these trumpets. So if you really wanted to balance this, then this should be forte crescendo to fortissimo, right? And then the strings will still be not quite as strong as the, uh, as the trumpets here. Um, so this is the second score I've seen recently where the horns were divided from the brass. And I really prefer that, like, um, you know, if this were a uh, Sibelius score, I would just grab this line and yank it down to here, right? So... Uh, it just really, it's just distracting to have this extra, these extra like two staves all on their own up here. So try to, you know, try to just have that unified. That would also not confuse a conductor, but annoy. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, but yeah. And I, one last thing to comment on here. I just really love the way that snare drum comes in here and starts to comment, right? And just start, and then right here just starts to keep up. You know, I mean, this is this is uh, this seamstress isn't just like sewing clothing; she's building entire worlds, right? 
Um, so, yeah, this is obviously, um, you know, maybe she's reflecting everything into her work, this uh, whole world of experience, including perhaps uh, war or some kind of battle or some other kind of thing. So, yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it really is such a cool, such a strong um, way of interpreting this material. Just really, I have very few problems with this whatsoever, but it's just that just the transition between these two sections. I am wondering um, whether or not there was just a like, like whether this phrase might have been misinterpreted or just it came a little like this approach came a bar too early or something like that. Anyway, but not to dwell on it too much, but I really did enjoy it, though. It's a very, very cool page. And that just leads takes us to the lead up to the mini apotheosis and you know very very strong thick dense scoring um especially with the you know with the uh, uh brass backing it up here um all right so yeah there's really really fast fluid scoring in the horn you might want to rethink that it's it's going to just have huge amounts of force um alongside all these other lines and which will sort of become uh, almost secondary, right? Like you're having your horn player, maybe this was a copy paste error too, like it should have gone to another part, but anyways, um, yeah, and you're expecting these beautiful fluid lines here, which, you know, goes all the way down to a written E. Um, I mean, it's all playable. It's nothing, nothing all that different from other particular like symphonic scoring. But just to think, right, that you are going to be doubling the oboe. Wow, once again, going way down there to B, fl B flat. Excuse me. Um, yeah, there's almost nothing going on here. Like you got the, like, wouldn't it be better to put this, uh, sorry, this oboe line right here, like kind of accompanying the, um, the, uh, Oh, geez, like there's almost nothing in between right in here, right? So you've got this big gap in here uh, between the flute and the oboe. There's And you're pushing the oboe really, really low, but there's like nothing in the middle, right? Okay, so yeah, that might be a bit problematic right in there. Um, but... Anyway, I mean, I know you want some space in there for what the trumpets are doing and everything else. But, I mean, that's that's cool. And it's kind of cool that it's coming from either side. But still, those are some really low oboes right there. Um, yeah. But, all right. All right. But, yeah, but still I just feel like this this might not be the most, the best conceived way to deal with a... Um, you know, like accompanying everything. And also like when you back off here, this line will just lose strength really rapidly going into in into this. I mean, it's it's strong enough. I think that this is just totally strong enough on the wind. You just totally do not need that um, that line there, like the, the 16ths. Okay. Um, yeah, now here is where we really get organ-like textures, um, which I was lecturing about in the last evaluation just and and you could hear it in the mock-up too just like they're just monumental pipe organ sound starting from right here and it just really has to do with playing the lowest notes possible um you know just having that nice uh chunky uh bass trombone and everything else and 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 so on but but yeah but it's still all right it's 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 you know it in a live performance it'll sound a lot less organ like right but it'll still be very very heavy uh, yeah, so, so otherwise, maybe there need to be some hairpins like going on to the end of this particular line and then maybe retardando and then just picking it up right again from there. Otherwise, really, really cool leading right up here to rehearsal mark B. Now, from this point on, you probably noticed that this sounded like really like Shostakovich right here in the strings. And that's because you didn't mark down the, um, the dynamics here, right. To, to balance. So like the, 
the lower strings and viola they're just really playing loudly still from way back here so but i'm not sure if you wanted that like i would say maybe come back in here say f sempre if you really wanted this to be standing out i mean it was a cool effect but obviously not i, I don't know to me it was pretty obvious that it wasn't really exactly what you wanted okay um and uh yeah but it's just kind of hard to tell that just the dynamics are kind of funky here like you've got these, you got crescendo here to mezzo piano in the strings, right? The softer kind of group. And you've got crescendo to mezzo forte in the trumpets, right? A3, right? They're still A3. So that is just some, you know, the, the trumpets here would completely outplay the, um, the strings. They're just really like way overbalanced. Now, uh, with all respect, looking at this, it just really feels more like clarinets and oboes rather than the, um, you know, the trombones and trumpets. You know, you, you're, you're scoring A3 here, you're scor scoring, I, I don't know, I'm assuming this would be A2, right? You're going, you know, you're jumping up here from E flat to A and then down to E flat here. That's just, just a it that's you know and like and asking the trombone player to slur all these pitches and essentially you know what what are we doing here let's just be completely frank about it we're doubling the uh the violas right um to a degree um and you know is is that intended to blend right or is, or is it intended to be sort of a brassy sound along with the strings okay well that's all good um, what if you were able to kind of like have this play down a little bit, right? So this A could be that A, the, the, tr the trumpet part could be significantly down and everything else because you are asking the players to go all the way up to a high D in mezzo piano. And that is, you know, a high D, it just really takes all the focus that a player could possibly play. And it like it still would be kind of a note that that most players would not want you to play unless they asked you to score it for them. Right. So it is just really high. Maybe you could do everything the way that you've got it and then just drop this an octave. Right. And just get rid of this A in here. OK, that's just that's just way out there. Um, the other problem, too, is is just dynamically we've got all this mezzo stuff going on all right mezzo piano here mezzo forte there the strings should be if this is intended to blend the strings should be marked up and the brass should be marked down all right that is number one rule okay um and like i mean there's just no need for like and and the other thing too is that like like having every single bar crescendo forwards we lose the um the push like there's a push right on the last bar into this sort of frolicking part right in here right so um yeah i i think that this was supposed to be like a forward and reverse hairpins right it wasn't supposed to be bum, 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 right sort of rather than just everything pushing forward and then drop dropping back down i'd, I'd have to review the score but but yeah um yeah, I just I feel that the that this needs to be rethought a bit. Uh but and yeah, just like mezzo piano to mezzo forte. I've said it before, I'm gonna say it again. Please, people, like you know, in some I think I think I might have said this on some of the same scores. Mezzo forte to mezzo piano, mezzo piano to mezzo forte is just really not very far. It is almost like you know, they mezzo piano and mezzo forte are not rungs on a ladder, right? They are inflections of force and restraint. Right, so mezzo piano is an inflection of piano. Mezzo forte is a inflection or dim diminution of forte. All right, but they're not like neighbors, and they're not something you push from one to the other. Right, I'm just like, just really try to get people to to focus more on on crescendo marks that really increase. Right, that really add color, that do something, that have a function rather than just are a slight nudge. Right. So anyways, that's, sorry to be all preachy about that, but I'm just really, I'm seeing it appear too many times in scores and also bump from, you know, from some people whose scores I have 
evaluated quite a few times and may have mentioned this once or twice to them already. So, so please, folks, really back off on you know, and like. And there are some things in here that don't make sense at all. Mezzo forte crescendo to mezzo forte, right? So, I'm um, maybe some of the editing on the on the dynamics could have been done a little bit. But look, why not go down to me to just piano, right? Why not start at forte and go down to mezzo piano, right? Try to have more, you know. You know, crossing the barrier from forte to piano should be something that is more of a deliberate thing than just fudging fudging around in that sort of nebulous gray area of mezzo. Okay. Um, I really love this nice skipping rhythm and then just like right on the beat with these other ones. That really makes a huge difference, I'll, even though there isn't an enormous change of texture, right? We, we still have a lot of the instruments at play in both, you know, the first two bars and then the third bar. But that really does help, right? It, it's it's just a, a cool thing to do, and then kind of pretty much the same treatment again as it as it had before. Um, you know, trombone teaming up with uh, the bassoon family is always fun, and then timpani once again, and you know you could have just hit three Ds in a row and and been just as effective, right? and save a lot of retuning. Then kind of the same thing again, but this time more organized on the kind of reaction bar. Yeah, and, and here like like getting the scoring the flute way down low like this. Um, yeah, just you know when you've got horns and trumpets at play <clears throat> is just going to disappear, right? And then and then asking. I mean, it would be better to bring in the oboe right around here or the, have the English horn play the first three notes and then go right into this, right? It's just, just playing to the st absolute strengths. <clears throat> this is all good in the winds and strings. Yeah, and like I'm just confused why the flute is playing this line down here and it's not not doubling the first violins. Right, like same thing with the oboe. This could have all been an octave higher, supporting these strings and helping them from becoming overwhelmed. But instead, like you've got the flutes and the um, the the flute and the oboe competing with the trumpet and trombone on the same exact pitches. Right, they're just are not, they're just going to blow those flutes out of the water. Right, uh, so it really would have been better to have these upper winds doing a more traditional function of supporting or doubling the uh, the violins, right? So, yeah, okay, and then we get to the Bordine Waltz right in here, and this is all pretty cool. Yep, no no problems except for, once again, you know, support, yeah, support your local strings. Um, yeah, they're you know, flute and oboe are just going to disappear underneath these sforzando trumpets. But put them up an octave, and they can help these strings so much. Okay, then we got these big barking chords. Now here, I feel that there is a problem in that the only on the beat, or the only like low counterpart to each of these enormous chords is just single bass notes. And like I would say either just get rid of those notes and just have this be like just all kind of off beats when we're breaking things down into you know into like say three four right in here for this just for this little section um, or support these low I mean you don't really need these low all these low instruments playing along with this massive chord right you could put your bassoons or your at least your contrabassoon, your bass trombone, and your tuba, uh, timpani could all support or play along with the double basses, right? And that way you get the back and forth feeling, but it's all fourth, right? No back. All right, and then just this big smear downwards. That's all right. Harp is just completely useless here. It should like not even exist until right around here because there that will be the impression that the or that the 
everybody gets, including the harpist. They're, they'll, their fingers will be moving and they can't hear themselves. All right, so just wait until here. Just imagine if you were playing guitar in an orchestra, right? Like nobody would hear your guitar until things got pretty soft. And the harp has got around the same amount of projection, right? So it just, it, yeah, you sh just should not score like this when they're, you know, like a glissando would work great, right? A big ripping roll on very high pitches would, would work um, out of the way of everybody else. But yeah, but playing the same exact pitches as everybody, it just is, you know, this roll uh, is not high enough to be heard. Um, these little notes here do not even add tone weight, okay? Um, yeah, so just kind of looking at this... Um, at this little rip downwards, clarinets, oboe, flute, and then flute jumping up to support the piccolo. That's really great. And then the oboe jumping up to support, uh, to double the flute. That's also good, right? <clears throat> only one, <clears throat> only one string group, just the firsts, right? I mean, did, did the second violin really need to change what it was doing and help out with this other stuff, right? Could other instruments like, you know, uh, low winds, low brass have helped out with this and then left the upper strings to be able to add their their strength to these descending lines? There's, you know, some things to think about. And this really goes, you know, just way down low here without any kind of um, doubling by strings or anything. From this part onward, there are a few wrong notes, um, a few miscues, uh, a few kind of, it just feels a little rushed there, Doug. I mean, and I, I totally understand if you were trying to get through it and get on to the next thing and so on. Um, and, or, or just, you know, or maybe you were on a roll. <laughs> okay, but there are a few things in here just really have to watch out for, like, up to this point, you've been really, really careful about how you score like uh, arpeggios and and everything else, and tr you're trying to make sure that they're not too unrealistic for certain instruments. But uh, you know, look, this this kind of scoring for contrabassoon that just like they just don't really that I mean, there some contrabassoonists will be able to play this, but it's really a virtuosic kind of part for that instrument. And the same thing is true for you know, for a double bass, you know, I mean, I mean, would there, could there not have been a way to trade this between certain instruments here? Um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing some pitches in here that are sort of uh, in, at, at octaves or just interacting a little bit with the second violins. Maybe the second fi violins could have played some of this as, um, as octaves, divisi octaves, and then the violas could have traded off some notes with the cellos and made this a little bit more playable, right? And then, like, once again, like, this is the, this is actually the perfect place to throw in the harp, and that's what I did too, but there's so much huge mass here in terms of scoring that the harp is, you know, once again, just, you know, it won't, will not be heard, and it's, and in fact, it is marked softer than these monstrous instruments that want to stomp all over its beautiful tone, <laughs> right? If this were a, a couple octaves higher, no problems, right? And marked up to forte or, or triple, sorry, up to um, double F or triple F, right? Uh, but maybe there's just too much weight on this right here. You know, maybe if this were, like if you wanted some of these elements, like it certainly is possible on clarinet, and bass, uh, sorry, bassoon, um, oh, sorry, bass clarinet and bassoon. So, so this is, it's sort of, I mean, bassoon, it's possible, a little, like, not the most opportune line, but still playable, really great on bass clarinet. Uh, contrabassoon, like most contrabassoonists, I think, like, they would have to practice and practice and practice, their moment comes and goes and they end up mess missing a few notes, right? And then just for strings, it's just really, it's like not too great for the basses at all. A good cellist could play this, but it's really more of like a like a concerto part, right? Like, you know, you you would want your, your cello soloist to play a line like this, right? So I just think some of this needs to be rethink, rethought, excuse me, rethinked, uh, <laughs> and uh, trimmed down a little bit. 
Um, yeah, and then, like, man, you're writing this high D for the trumpet, right? And, like, this, you just, you get a really bright, beautiful tone from trumpet that is, like, an octave lower, and then the overtones will, like, support everything that is over it, right? Like these, like these flutes up here, right? So you just drop the trumpet down an octave, and it's a fine, it's a really great part. Um, yeah, so just some, some wild optimism in there. Um, but, I mean, not... I mean, it's it's the kind of stuff that should work, right? If everybody could play incredibly well. Uh, and then, you know, like, things would have to be pretty soft to maintain this harp scoring in here. And it would have to be marked F, right? Or FF. Uh, I mean, you've already got your pizzicato right in here, right? So, like, it's just a, you know these instruments are going to pluck those pitches way better than, you know, and sound way louder than the harp could ever sound, right? So the harp isn't really doing anything. Um, yeah. But, I mean, otherwise, pretty cool. Like, coming back to our little Borodin waltz again, right in here. Um, you know, not too badly scored. Still confusing the hell out of me that they're, that the, um, the bar line doesn't go all the way through the through the brass, but I can see that just like, you know, you might have just been editing and getting ready to export this and your mouse caught like right in between these two, um, these two staves and separated it. So, I mean, those little arrows creep in from time to time. See, this is so much better scored, right? This is, you've got your flute and oboe up there doubling the uh, first, uh, first violins, right? And just like leaving this area in here free to, to not be so, like, not have so much competition. But this is confusing me. Like, the rests disappeared um, right at the beginning of this bar. So, uh, yeah, and sort of in between these pitches. So that's a little strange there, man. But anyway, I don't know how that happened, but just watch out for those things if you do go into a final editing stage on this piece. And, you know, pretty much, once again, I've said what I'm going to say about this. I mean, still, I mean, there's there's some cool stuff in here that can be saved, but it just needs to be um, redone quite a bit. Yeah, and just, man, punching these A's, these low A's on that bass trombone and jumping all the way up to this G. Um, you know, you don't need to do that. All right, same thing here. I mean, the tuba can go can do this probably with no problem you know i mean there there could be some other voices like you got two trombones right shouldn't this be two trombones maybe the second trombone could be playing that g and like not torturing your bass trombone player so much that's what i'd do to solve that problem and then like just you know look at the density of this all right just how many people are playing that one line and look at this poor harp harpist trying to make an impression right they'll be lost in the crowd you know they just just think of a harp as being no low no louder than an acoustic guitar sitting there in the middle of all those players right trying to make a sound right so just really you know don't don't waste don't waste any and especially with this like this is such chromatic scoring with the harpist having to change their pedals constantly right so just putting so much of a burden on them all right then continuing on, things mellow out. I just really love a lot of elements here, like just this cute little innocent oboe line here right at the end. That's so cool, you know, and just the way you're calming everything down here. Um, you know, it, it's, it's nice. You're just mellowing out on the accompaniment here, just scaling things down. That's all very cool. Ending up here with just a bit of bassoon. Um, I think you forgot something here about oboes, is that their lowest note is a B-flat, right? So this is an English horn part, right? So maybe you intended to put it there. Anyhow. Now, going towards the end here, if you listen to your mock-up, you, you can hear that there are some, um, there's some wrong notes here and there. I'm not going to pick them out for you, but just that, like, kind of do not follow exactly right now with this much pizzicato happening you're not going to really hear the harp so might as well just save like the harp could like play high octaves or something like that uh and it would be heard a lot bit a lot better 
So, um, yeah. See now, I'm now I'm. It's bothering me, and I'm thinking which which were the wrong notes in there. <laughs> um, anyhow, you know, all pretty cool. I, you know, I'm just wondering why everything had to end on a mezzo piano and and crescendo, right? Why not just end soft? Right? It doesn't have to get loud. It could just be pianissimo all the way through, or piano all the way through, and th then just end on an accent, right? Because that's kind of what you're saying, anyways. By just you know, putting an accented staccato at the end, it's going to be sort of mezzo piano-ish, right? But it'll, you know, it'll actually be inhabiting that world of piano, right? Once again, I'm just sort of making my imaginary circle here, right? And there's the world of P. <laughs> the world of the piano dynamic, of the restrained dynamic, sorry. Um, and then you pianissimo, triple P over here. All right, mezzo piano right over here, intersecting a little bit with mezzo forte, with this other world over here of forte. So piano right in here is a big world, all right? The Mark P can cover all of this territory in here and have inflections and have life and, and sound and it can flex and it can do all kinds of things, right? Without having to mark mezzo piano or, or sorry, I want to say double P, uh, with pianissimo, right? You just this, this is a big world. Piano is a big world. It does not have to be moderated constantly with mezzo piano. It does not have to be snipped off on the nose by too much pianissimo, right? It is its own thing. And you could just leave this just sitting at pianissimo or piano and then just stick an accent on the end and don't even have like a staccato. Just like end with an accent or with a little marcato mark. But everybody still piano or pianissimo. You get exactly the same effect. So you can do a lot of these, a lot of this tweaking of the strength of things just through the through your articulation marks. Okay, um, but other than that, other than all those things that I picked apart, pretty good score. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean that's like if I if I had had nothing to talk about by saying, hey, that was pretty good. Oh, look, look, here's another really cool thing, and oh wow, that you know, and that part is is really great too, right? You know, that, that would like be the most boring evaluation ever. So I, I'm really glad that this gave me something to think about and to talk about and to elaborate on and lots of different ideas for orchestration tips in the future and everything else. Um, so yeah, so, so thank you, Doug. Thank you for entering your score once again and uh, giving, you know, giving me such a cool score to look at and ooh and ah over and then pick apart and you know and for supporting on patreon that just really makes a huge difference and and you know is really enabling me to do all this really great stuff and you know i just feel like this is my time of the year that i get to reach out and just really um you know bring the community together and and to give everybody feedback and help and 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 advice and you know, and, and help them to become better orchestrators if I, if I possibly can. So, so, you know, it really means a lot and, and thank you so much. All right. And now on to yet another entry, which I just really am enjoying. I'm on a roll. This is my fourth today and I'm going to do another five on Sunday before I go on vacation. So this is just really, really great. Uh, thanks everybody.